Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Matthew Stadler. I'm one of the people working here at the U of O. Um, I'm just letting you know a couple things. Uh, we have delicious food back there, as you see, uh, and new old Lompoc, a local brewery up in North Portland, has donated some beer, and as soon as our licensed bartender arrives, uh, he'll be serving some. Uh, so we're waiting just a little bit both for that uh, and so we can get ourselves all collected here on stage. Uh, one thing you see in front of you uh, is a set of Twitter feeds that are, are being aggregated. They're all marked with the mark, uh, hash mark, free culture, one word, free culture. So uh, as you're listening or even now, uh, if you want to contribute at all to that stream, go ahead and, and uh, use Twitter to uh, comment on free culture. It's a device we're going to use in the second half of tonight's um, interesting mashup of both talk and co-authoring together. In the second half, we're going to use that Twitter feed as a way to let any of you who didn't uh, happen to bring a laptop computer with you, uh, but who are interested in contributing, uh, contribute parts to our attempt to write new copyright law together. Uh, by the end of tonight, we will have written a whole new approach to copyright, and all of the old problems will be behind us. Uh, but I see that there's, <laughs> I see there's a question over here. Uh, it's just people's tweets. There we go. So yeah, if you put anything in uh, through Twitter and you include the hash mark free culture, one word, uh, it will appear on our aggregator. Uh, and so in that way, uh, you can participate at any moment you like, including now. You might notice that uh, many people from Brazil are participating with our meeting tonight. Uh, this shows the great reach of our programming, uh, and uh, I hope you join them. Uh, so, yeah, have some food, uh, there's water, and soon some beer, and we'll be starting in the next five, ten minutes. Twittering a lot, I'm doing it right now. No, it's just live updating of no, the thing as you were talking. Well, you're bored, you Twitters. <laughs> Maybe we should play this other record while we're waiting. <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not this one. <laughs> I have a really to be able to whatever you type. It's sure a really pretty there. record. Oh, what's that? This, uh, this side is a playable picture disc, and this side is an unplayable <laughs> etching. Go ahead and look at the etching on there. Oh, is that the Goody Paul record? Yeah. Hold it and, and you know, just get up there, get up close to it, <laughs> get in there. It's yeah, it's really really detailed. The etching, nuts. Oh yeah, all right. There's like oh, rooms and stuff on there. They're on there. I'm on there. I know. I know all about it. Thank you. Is the back color too? Mm -hmm. That looks cool. Right? Yeah. This is the playable thing. I have a client that uh, makes those. You just want us a new cut. No, really? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, right. I don't know, we just, you just, just sent us a new cut, so that's positive, I think. Yeah, this record, is this the record he made out of, like, sound design that he did for other companies? That's part of it, yeah. It's not exclusively that company. He's a sound designer, and yeah, he was paid for, like, Nokia and Hitachi and Sony and Chupa Chups. Yeah, Chupa Chups. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, the main rotating one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, he made jingles for those, for those people. Who, you know, you're explicitly not supposed to use them for him. They buy them outright. Yeah. But he, they're all on this record. Didn't he dub them out? Explicitly yeah. listed, yeah. And like, yeah, edited or whatever. Sure, I think we're waiting on the bartender, but yeah. We're fine. I mean, if you wanted to end it, start at 6 30 and end at 7 15. And it's like 6 45, so we'll just end at 7 30. Yeah, we, don't need, we need to be down at the other thing at like. There's two here if you no, want there's, It's on the podium. We should probably turn those ones on. It's good. Okay, I think we'll get started, even though people are still finding their way from the buffet to their seats, which is great. Uh, we encourage you to uh, move back and forth throughout the evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here to our program, Free Culture. My name is Karen Monroe, and I'm the head of the UO Portland Library and Learning Commons here in Whitestag, and I have a soundtrack. <laughs> Excellent. So this is uh, the second event in a series that we're having this month uh, at the UO Portland. Um, the series focuses on themes of creativity and sustainability in the city, and we have a terrific panel here today to talk about the present state of copyright and maybe the future of copyright and the arts in particular. Um, so we're going to have some, uh, start out with some conversation with the panel and then move into a participatory reauthoring of copyright law. And then we'll tell you more about that as we, as we go. Before we get uh, too far into it, I'd like to just thank our sponsors for the evening. Uh, we are sponsored by the University of Oregon Libraries, by the University of Oregon Academic Affairs, and by UO Cultural Forum. And we're also very grateful to local businesses, New Old Lompoc, for their fantastic beer. And I think I just saw our OLCC licensed bartender walk in. Hey, Daniel. Excellent. Daniel, everyone, can we have a, a round of applause for Daniel? <laughs> Daniel was not on deck for tonight, but he's pinch hitting for us. Thank you. Um, so New Old Lompoc has been a terrific sponsor for us. And also Elephant's Deli has provided this fantastic buffet at the back of the room. We hope you'll enjoy all of that. Um, I mentioned this is a uh, part of a series, this event, so there will be uh, two more events in the series the following Thursday nights this month. You can join us down here at White Stag, 6 o'clock Thursday nights. The 23rd, next Thursday, we'll have a, an event called Beautiful Soup, an assessment of current visual culture. And on the 30th, you can ride your bike down here for Rules of the Road. We'll be talking about bicyclists' rights and responsibilities. All of these events are free and open to the public. And uh, as I said, they'll start at 6 o'clock. So I wanted to give very quick introductions of our fantastic panel and our moderator um, before we get going. And then I'm going to step out of the way and let them take it. Um, many of you probably already know many of these folks by reputation or personally. But for those of you who don't, um, our moderator is Matthew Stadler. Hi, Matthew. Uh, Matthew's a writer and editor, co-founder of Clear Cut Press, The Back Room, and the Global Cities Project, Suddenly. His interest in copyright law is keen, especially since he wrote a cover of a classic novel he especially admires, John Le Carré's A Murder of Quality. Tonight, Matthew hopes to learn if his version of this classic murder mystery called La Cucaracha is illegal. 
And I'm going to read the biographies that you guys gave me. So if they're irreverent, it's not me. <laughs> Peter Shaver, Peter Von Shaver, on the end here, is a Portland-based arts and entertainment attorney. He specializes in intellectual property and general business law. His emphasis is on copyright, trademarks, music, entertainment, and art law, nonprofit organizations, internet law, licensing, and business creation. His firm, Sound Advice, works with creative people and businesses of all kinds. He's a regular lecturer for Portland area universities, colleges, and community groups. Jonna Bechtolt is a musician and multimedia artist best known for his work at Yacht. He was raised on the western shores of Oregon. He fell into technology and music at a young age after he dropped out of school in the seventh grade. He got his GED and hopes to one day receive an honorary degree. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> it says here. In 2009, he was ideologically incarcerated for software piracy by a faceless jury of internet nerds after openly discussing his pirated materials. Claire Evans, Claire L. Evans, is a renowned science writer best known for her innovative science column, Universe, first published from Occidental College in Los Angeles. She's a member of the band Yacht and has been gaining attention for the web and video art she's been creating for the past three years. A believer in the technological singularity, Evans has presented work at The Kitchen, PS1 MoMA, the National Institute of Health, the Peggy Notebart Nature Museum in Chicago, and the Brooklyn International Film Festival. Marcus Estes. Marcus, was raised in the shadow of NASA in Huntsville, Alabama. He worked for some time at WFMU in New York and was on the board of Portland Community Media TV. He was involved in the early stages of Autobot, a Linux-based podcasting machine. He now works for open sorcery and makes public access television. And K. Mike Merrill is a publicly traded person, offering shares of himself to anyone interested in taking a stake in his future. Originally from the wastelands of northern Alaska, Merrill escaped to Alabama and then Germany before settling in Portland. He was one of the key founders of UrbanHonking.com, a Portland-based blogging community, and hosted The Ultimate Blogger, the Internet's first reality television show. So we have a diverse and fascinating panel here today, and um, they have a lot to talk about. So I think the best thing for me to do is uh, yeah, pass it over to them. With one, one caveat, I think you mentioned the Twitter hashtags. Yeah. Very good, okay. I'm gonna pass this over to Matthew and the group. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Karen Monroe is the head librarian here at the uh, University of Oregon Portland Library and Learning Commons. Uh, and in addition to events like this that are free and open to the public, the Library and Learning Commons right across uh, this uh, atrium is a open public facility that you can come and use uh, and we encourage you to do so. Um, I asked Karen to hand me the mic because um, I wanted to point out, you, you probably, uh, Peter uh, Shaver, who's a copyright lawyer and a U of O grad, uh, is uh, on the stage here with four members of Yacht. Uh, Yacht is uh, available to all of you as well. In fact, there's probably other members of Yacht in the audience. You simply go to their website, teamyacht.com, and sign up, and you are also a member of this project. Uh, so, but uh, there's, there's some music playing, and I wonder uh, if you'd tell us what's going on here. So. Um, wow, it's louder. This is a record that I made in 2004 with a friend of mine. Uh, and yeah, I guess I have a direct question for you, Peter. Um, it's made up entirely of Nirvana samples, and I wanted to know what, what's wrong with that. <laughs> what's wrong with that? And it's called Nirvana. Um, and this is Bob Marley on the cover, which is probably also a problem. Well, I, I mean, from a, s a strict legal standpoint, what let you've me, let done... Let me turn it off. we got enough of it now. It's cool. What you've done by, by sampling it or to actually create this whole thing is it's basically a derivative work. Right. And in theory, when you're using a sound recording to create a derivative work, there are two copyright rights involved, the first of which is uh, you need to talk to the owner of the whoever wrote the song and their publishing company to get one right, and then there's the, uh, the right to use the actual uh, sound recording itself, which is typically owned by a label. So in theory, what you coulda, shoulda, woulda done is gone and gotten licenses from both those people, told them, hey, I'm doing this little art project. How much, how much does that cost? Uh, bazillions of dollars, probably. Or, th or they would flat out say, don't do it. Uh -huh. um, I worked with uh, the band Negative Land back in the day, and they, um, kind of did a similar thing. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what they did. They took um, a little bit of the song, um, the U2 song, Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, 
added some backing tracks to that and added a bunch of other kind of sound collage elements to it. And they put that out, and can we see the, 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 you know, the album again? They put out a big thing that said U2 on the front. They had a picture of the U2 spy plane, which the band was named after. And part of it was, well, it came out uh, right around the same time as um, a, a one of the major U2 albums. And part of it was they were saying that you've created confusion in the marketplace from a trademark standpoint. And the, the word Nirvana on there, an unsuspecting person <laughs> might walk into a record store and go, oh, whoa. Yeah, it's, it's, the it's the same typeface and everything. Yeah, yeah, and maybe it's a, and it looks like there's a picture of Bob Marley on there as yeah. well. So maybe they would think that it's, it's, it's Nirvana doing Marley covers or the well, lost it's, tapes it's or. Uh, it's Nirvana's last record, this is. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. As a band. <laughs> um, and, and, and what, so, so, Negative Land got in a lot of trouble on all kinds of levels for it. And the band was actually okay with it. They were like, you know, fine, whatever. But uh, their record company was upset. Uh, Casey Kasem, the uh, America's Dab 40 DJ guy, had some stuff on there. He uh, was upset because it was him swearing a blue streak for five minutes. Um, and there were a bunch of other elements there. And they got sued. They lost very badly and were kind of. In, in, in to a certain extent, sued out of, uh, in, in basically into oblivion. So, in theory, with and, and the, the problem with that, it was a fairly high-profile thing. And what I usually tell people who come in with these type of projects, I just say, you you can do a little of this stuff, just don't be successful at all with it. Right. And if that was your intention to kind of do a little subversive, below the radar kind of thing, um, what you've done actually too is, I mean. Listening to that, you would never know. Most people would not know that it's uh, anything to do with Nirvana. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like if you've taken it down to just those milliseconds of, of, of bits that you've remixed, uh, it, it kind of becomes a fair use because you've taken so little. And even if you've created a, a ostensibly commercial product with it, um, it does compete in the same sphere as their recording. So right. the further away you go, and I'm often asked, is there a, like a certain amount you can take and reuse? Um, and uh, unfortunately, the law on sampling is very well established, where even if you take a little bit of a, a, a bass line or a James Brown trademark Yelp and repeat that over and over, that is over the edge. There's every case that's been decided pretty much says that that type of sampling, you need those two licenses I talked about, and that's how it goes. What if you recreate it instead of, what if you recreate it instead of sample? If you recreate it, you still have to get the rights from the publishing company, because. But then is there, a, is there an amount that the recreation would have to be in order to, to count? <laughs> sampling amount makes sense, but is there an amount to recreate that would also make you liable? Like, if I recreate a half a second of someone's song. Uh, but even recreating it, I mean, you, as I said, it implicates the publishing right, but um, it, it, it's kind of, the general axiom is is less is more. So the less, uh, the less you take, the more rights you have to use that. And in this case, um, if, if they're just little, little bits that are almost uh, virtually unrecognizable from the source material, that is more of a fair use rather than taking a minute or something so or repeating a, like the famous, um, well anyway, I mean. It right, yeah, I've heard fair use thrown around a lot like in reference to like stuff like girl talk. So what exactly, what, is, what does fair use entail? Like are th what are the parameters of fair use? Fair use basically, I mean any use of other people's creative content in theory is a, uh, an infringement. But the, the, the federal copyright law provides for, you know, it, it's kind of uh, a, a door into the fenced area that is copyright protection, and it allows you to reuse certain things without permission. So even, right. it, it, and it's a defense to copyright infringement. So in theory, you're infringing, but you have this, this very thin ability to reuse that material, and there's, it gets kind of technical, but basically for uses of parody, scholarship, research, things you could do in this educational environment that you can't do when you walk outside the door there. Uh, so there's a number of things there. And then you, um, uh, and, and all the things like on Saturday Night Live, it's just one of those things where the, it, it, was, it was factored into the copyright law because we want that kind of dialogue back and forth with certain elements of it. And if you're doing a Star Wars parody, there's a lot of things you need to borrow from that original so people get the joke. Parodies are legal in that sense. So I'm, uh, I'm kind of interested in the two sides. On the one side, we're going to learn more about exactly what copyright law forbids. 
uh, the kind of hard walls that are there. But on the other, which uh, John is pushing at, is what are these margins that are allowing uh, different kinds of use, different kinds of improvisation? Um, you began with the example of if you don't get famous doing it, if you do it under the radar, um, and I'm, uh, that's a possible arena in which you can do work uh, that contravenes law, but it, it still floats. Uh, second, fair use, which has a body of legal um, language around it. It's a very developed idea. Fair use is one that you could probably defend in court. Um, you mentioned parity also, different kinds of use. Um, and I guess I'd, I'm curious, one, is there a body of law around what it means to be under the radar, or are you simply saying just don't get pulled into court and you're going to be okay? Right, because like with this, with this record, we only made 300 copies and there was no label involved. We, it was a personal project, so we never got in trouble. It came out in 2005 or six. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all, all what I said before. Just don't be successful with it. And it, it, sold it, all of them. it, it doesn't yeah. make it any, any less illegal. Yeah. I mean, what you've done is still illegal, don't get me wrong, but right. that, okay. that flying into the, the radar, doing it on a minimal kind of basis like that. Um, you know, generally, if, if I'm a creator, I make a certain product and it's reused. If I like the way it's being reused, I don't have to go after that thing. It's at my discretion. So even if Nirvana or their heirs or Courtney Love you know, saw this thing and just said, <laughs> you know, I. I think that's kind of cool. I'm okay with that. They can give you that permission or make that decision on their own to not pursue it. Right. So it's kind of one of those things, like with you too, when Negative Land caught up with them and said, I can't believe you guys, a fellow musicians and creative people, are like angry about this. Said, we're not, you know, it's our, it's our label that's really driving this whole thing. So. Well, these are two different kinds of safety. One is the one where what you're doing is illegal, but there's nobody invested in, in, you know, in getting you for it. Um, and then there's the other where the law is evolving in a way that allows people to do work that may have contravened previous standards of copyright. Uh, and I'm kind of curious about that part where the law itself is evolving. Um, is there anywhere? Uh, is the law, for instance, taking into account um, uh, creative remixing that re repurposes something as a new? I, it, there's, there's a couple points I'll make on that. A, a number of years ago, there was a, a, a Supreme Court case um, involving the, the group Two Live Crew. And what that basically said, and it, this was a, it, they wanted to do uh, a kind of a parody cover version of Pretty Woman, a very famous song from the, the 60s or 50s. And, um, and the publisher didn't want them to do it. They, all these things, they went ahead and did it, and they added some kind of salacious um, lyrics to the whole thing went all the way up through all these different court levels as to, you know, was that legal? You've created, you've taken the, some of that song composition, redid your own version of it, and in theory, someone could walk into a, a record store and say, I want Pretty Woman, and would they be confused by, by these two things? Went all the way to the Supreme Court, and there was a, a, a decision that came out of that that said that what they did, yes, they took some of this stuff without permission, used it when they were told not to do it, and they created a work that really exists. It's so far from the original, and they said that the, the transformative aspects of it, you created such a radical thing, so even that theoretically really dumb person walking into a record store, what, record store, is that an old school concept? <laughs> iTunes. Um, but uh, not in Portland, actually. Yeah. They got records. Um, but it, so nobody would be confused, and that's, that secondary work is so unique and so kind of standalone that there would be no confusion, and that there is artistic merit to that transformation of that original to a kind of revised version. Um, and and it, there have been very few cases that have followed on that, but if any of you are aware of the uh, Associated Press versus Shepard Ferry case that's, that's, that's going on, um, there was an update on that Go ahead today, and but explain but, it. But they're talking about that. It's basically the, the Obama Hope poster that was taken from an AP photographer, or a, now he's saying he wasn't an employee of AP, so it's kind of it was his photo that just came out today, actually. But this whole big thing about taking that image, Shepard Ferry, a commercial artist making a poster that really became one of the iconic images of the whole campaign. Um, and it just blew up into this big thing, but yet it was based on AP saying an infringement of one of the photos that they own and control. Uh, so, but now I think Ferry's gonna be using it, that whole thing by saying, yeah, I took it, but I transformed it. And look how radically different it, this thing was from this original. 
And you think about a news photograph, it's something r fairly disposable. You see it in the paper the next day and it's gone. And then there's a, you know, more stuff, but it, very few photos have that kind of enduring kind of life after their initial intended use. Um, so there's that transformative aspect that's changed. The other kind of trend we have, and, and that's still playing itself out, that could be a real big bombshell of a case uh, if it goes further along or if they don't settle it um, um, beforehand. But what the other kind of trend you're seeing is large corporate interests driving U.S. copyright policy. You have people like the Disneys and, and Microsofts of the world saying, we create this very valuable intellectual property content that is really a, one of the drivers of, of the American economy. Overseas, we're really known for our media and our other kind of intellectual property out there. And so you have things like what I like to call the Mickey Mouse Protection Act that extended uh, the, the life of, of older uh, copywritten material. It was basically Steamboat Willie, the first uh, Mickey Mouse cartoon was about to go into the public domain, meaning anybody could take Mickey and do all kinds of nasty things with him. And, and so uh, the late Sonny Bono, uh, Congressman Bono, got this introduced and they, they retroactively applied this so very little will be falling into the, the, the public domain until 2019. Um, really crazy thing, but it's, it's those big corporate interests that are driving the, the bus on this. What keeps Walt Disney from getting sued for stealing Mickey Mouse from some other cartoonist? And uh, long story on that one. But, <laughs> it's, he, had but good, he had good attorneys back in the day, I think. Uh -huh. Did you have a question still? Yeah. Yeah, commentary and criticism are valid parts of that. And that's why when you're seeing a movie review on Siskel and Ebert, they can take clips and show it. Or, uh, you know, when, when somebody's even doing like a poetry review, they can <coughs> run a certain amount of a, 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 a poem to just say, this, look at this and this junk. You know, I mean, so there, there is that ability to, to, to use that stuff. Is the word criticism open-ended in that sense? I mean, could you paint a picture of Mickey Mouse that was you know, defacing Mickey Mouse and call it criticism of Walt Disney's, you know, corporate ideology, or is that, yeah. is that n no longer fair use? A lot of it is intent and, and context. Uh, Mattel has gone after a number of artists who have done kind of commentary things using Barbies. Uh, and, and, and basically those cases have been found that it is valid, even though you are taking kind of a, a copyrighted image and tweaking it and using it in a way that Mattel really is not happy with, you're still able to do that because there is that it, and, and it really is in the context of a gallery in that kind of thing, or it's kind of, um, so, so there is that element of that. You can do some of that stuff. A lot of the big contemporary sampling artists, uh, Girl Talk, Danger Mouse, there's been this big run of them in the past five years or so, are totally getting away with it. They're getting their albums released in big ways. What's keeping them from getting sued, taken down? Uh, just to show of hands, are, are audience members, are you familiar with Girl Talk? Okay, most of you are. Basically, uh, Girl Talk's a, a, I'm not sure what his technical music title is, just a... He's a dweeb. Okay, he's a, a, a production dweeb. Uh, and what he does is kind of intercut uh, if it, a lot of music from the 70s and 80s, uh, and he'll do, do these incredible remixes of rap songs with old Stevie Nicks songs, going into a Toto song, and it's all this just really amazing stuff. And it was uh, put out on the net for free, and it actually has appeared in physical form. So it went. It was signed to it to I mean a major, I believe, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, I don't think or it, it's, no, it's the it was. It's widely widly released yeah. at this point. Not, widely distributed. Yeah. It's not free. It's pay what you want for his. Okay. Yeah, that's. I think that's his own label. Uh, but but the, the stuff is put out there, and it, it's a th it's in unbelievably illegal, and it would take a lot of money to kind of uh, clear all the samples, both from publishing and sound recording usage. Um, to actually do that. Why he, nobody has gone after him may tie in with what I said before about people just approve of it or it's just, um, you know, wow, they use that little bit of uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot and now his sales are up. So his people can just go, oh, wow, it's, it's, it's bringing a new audience to our stuff and kind of as long as it's beneficial to us, they may be making that decision to not pursue it. But there's so many samples on there, I, I'm really flummoxed as to why they haven't, yeah, they haven't gotten any trouble. Yeah, because it's not all 70s and 80s. It's, it's a ton of it is like right. incredibly contemporary. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, is it uh, political in any capacity? Do, I mean, do you think that 
record labels think that it would just make them out like too much of a bad guy to go ahead and sue Girl Talk and it would hurt them? Or is that even not a, is that not even a factor? There's some of it, but most record companies are pretty just money oriented. I think if they thought that they could do it, they would go after them, uh, which I really am amazed that it hasn't happened because you know, normally the law is so well established on sampling that uh, and it, it's almost a hair trigger that any time, I mean, you look at the entertainment uh, news websites and whatnot, and half the time it's somebody suing something for the use of that, that, that thing I submitted to Michael Jackson or Britney Spears back in the day, and now there's a similar sounding song out there. People, they just go after it. They're very litigious in that sense. What if you did like a sampling, like the Nirvana record, but you you lied and you didn't actually sample it, you just said you did? Are you still liable? I, I think it, if you didn't actually commit a crime or, or, or do an infraction, that's probably okay. This sounds like it's not a hypothetical question. <laughs> but wouldn't that then put the burden on the people trying to sue you to prove that you actually did sample oh, oh, it? Yeah, I mean basically anytime you're trying to prove infringement, you have to prove that the infringer had access to the work and did indeed copy it. And largely that's proven by, um, uh, you know, kind of circumstantial evidence. A anytime I have a, 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 an allegation of uh, infringement, y you call the alleged infringer and they go, I didn't do it. You know, there's, there's nobody ever says, yeah, okay, you got me. It's always just, What about well, Negative Land, though? Did they admit to it? I think Negative Land may have admitted to it because it was so obvious, and that's their whole shtick. That's what they do and, uh, on any number of things, and it's really, uh, I mean, the, the, the commentary is really their whole thing. Their theory is that because we live in this incredibly media-saturated environment, they as artists should be able to kind of have a dialogue with that, that culture. So it's the commentary aspect, and they thought uh, really that in a lot of ways that the fair use thing was gonna get them through, but you know, too many interests that were too powerful. I, I wanted to ask if you feel like the negative line case was worth it. I mean, do you think that that produced uh, um, forward motion and the ability of artists to use material, or was it just a big old tragedy that they got n nailed for all that? If you ask the band, they'd say it wasn't worth it because, as he said, they were really sued into Bolivia, uh, oblivion. They were doing things, <laughs> things like um, you know, taking property and, and putting their mom's name on it so that they wouldn't have like stuff happen like that. They, and they were, and the thing that did come out of it, though, on their next albums, they uh, getting sued really gets you a, a quick and dirty. Um, uh, education on intellectual property law. So they knew, they, they I was working through a professor, uh, Keith Aoki at, at, at UVO, and, and they came to uh, the professor and they basically just said, for our next project, we've just been sued really badly, our next project, we want you to help us with this, and we want to be not on the cutting edge, but the bleeding edge, you know, really where it's going into the skin at that point. And they, because they had learned something about it, they wanted to push it just to the edge to see what that trigger would be, and uh, you know, I, I think Mark Hosler, the the main instigator there, really would love to have a Supreme Court with his name mm -hmm. case, you know, <laughs> kind of following up on on the two live crew case. But so, so here's the question then for the audience and for Yacht: uh, What is the court case we need now? What does a music group need to do that's illegal that's going to position this question properly? It could be a music group, it could be a visual artist like Shepard Ferry, and he's making some very intriguing arguments about, in a very high profile way, about the role of the artist with commentary, with some of these other things about really able to, to, to transform something, and I think that could be the big end there. Um, did I answer that question? I had a quick question related to when you were talking about sampling. This is also something from uh, when I've been doing YouTube stuff, I've gotten third-party content match complaints for um, recorded audio, copyrighted audio that occurred from videos that are the recording of an actual event where the copyright, copyright article would be like if there was a music playing here right now and someone was recording this, put it on YouTube, and then it got taken down because the music that was playing on the speaker system had to, was copyrighted. And that's, that's something I was kind of wondering about. Is it copyright infringement with the music if it's an actual event as it occurred? Yeah, in theory. I mean, technically it's a derivative work, so you do have to be really careful with that kind of stuff. And I mean, especially 
if it's news reporting, I'm here at the you know the PDX Pop now uh, City Hall event, and there's music playing in the background. Normally, as an incidental thing, that's okay. Um, but th it, there's a lot of gray area there, and generally, if especially in a commercial context, if you're doing something, you you would need to get a license to have even that incidental music in there. It was just a coincidence. Yeah, it was just a coincidence. Um, I, I actually learned the names of the songs from that. Uh, but yeah, I didn't intend to have that s the songs on there. I would find out that they were there once I found out there was a complaint. It hadn't even occurred to me in the first place. Yeah, one thing I'll point out up here, um, uh, copyright infringement is what's called a strict liability offense. So your intent is really immaterial. It's kind of a, you do the crime, you do the time thing. It doesn't matter what you thought. It doesn't matter what somebody told you. It didn't matter if you were using it for a non-commercial purpose in your mind. If the copyright holder did not give you permission or license to use it, in theory, you're in trouble. YouTube's, any, any, anybody in the chain of usage or distribution for that, they're all equally, jointly and severally liable. You could go after any or all of those parties for the infringement. So. Um, it, and it's a really kind of scary thing to be aware of. But. So, f so for example, here in Portland, uh, Artistry, which uh, hosts so many um, uh, bands, is now having to pay fees for times that the bands play cover songs. And as the venue, they are legally implicated if cover songs are played without uh, permission, which really puzzled me. I didn't realize that cover uh, was uh, something that the publisher of the music could make a claim against. Is that true? Yeah, it basically it's covered by what, what's called an ASCAP or a BMI license. Um, any venue that has I I either recorded music or live music, live musicians playing songs that are covered by certain publishing companies that get hooked up with them, uh, in theory, you collect a bunch of these licensing fees from venues and some of that money gets kicked back to the artists. So who's enforcing that? Like I specifically met with artist area? I, I met the guy once. He, they, they, both of them have a BMI and... and ASCAP have little Nazis that go around and just go to bars and just sit there and listen and say, oh, that's Bob Dylan. Let's see, that's, he's on our thing. And they will check and, and periodically, every, a, 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 usually every couple of years I'll get a bunch of calls, usually through the musicians union saying, hey, we're being shaken down by the ASCAP rep. And I have to tell you, every venue, the Rose Garden, uh, everywhere else they have an ASCAP, BMI, and there's another company called CSAC that does the same thing. They all have licenses with those companies in order to have live music there. Okay, for instance, like with specific reference to Yacht, did you guys do anything when you covered The Professionals and the other song from The Fabulous Stains? Did you guys pay any publishing rights for that? No. No. We didn't. <laughs> those are completely unauthorized covers. But again, we hope to go under the radar, I guess. Yeah. We, we, this is actually an interesting question. We covered uh, two songs that a fictional band plays in a movie. <laughs> well, I I Where are we at? Yeah, <laughs> there's still a Legally. songwriter. There's still a songwriter there's that's, still that's a credited. Songwriter and, and whoever produced that movie probably owns those as a work for hire. So it's right. kind of like um, you'd, there's that two-part licensing thing. Or really, if you're doing a cover version, you only have to get permission from the, uh, the publishing company. Right. You actually don't have to get permission, do you? You could... You could if it's right. <laughs> if, if if it's you can just pay a, a compulsory license for for a cover, correct? You don't have to contact anybody. You can just it's Harry Fox and you you pay the fee and then get it done. Well, there's a number of ways to do it. Harry Fox is basically a company that a lot of music publishers are hooked up with, saying if you want to re-record any of our compositions, doing cover songs, come to us. Tell us how many copies you're going to make, and we'll work out a license with you. Oh, okay. Now, if you have a publisher or a writer who does not want you to do their song or is not hooked up with Harry Fox, and as long as that song has been publicly released, there's a part of the federal copyright law uh, has this section on compulsory licensing, which basically just says you can take any publicly released song, do a cover of it, and without getting any permission, and then you, you have to send them checks, you've got to send them notice. So it kind of is outside of Harry Fox, but it's just directly using these guidelines set up by the federal government. So to broaden it a little bit, this all makes sense to us around music. We know the idea of a song and uh, how a tune has a particular signature that sticks in your head. And when you hear somebody pull even three notes out of a pop song, you can immediately hook it up. What about the realm of either public speech or text? Are the parameters similar? I mean, if I'm taking sentences of Le Carre, uh, as I do in the book I wrote, 
and, and l larding them into my text. Am I within fair use? Uh, it's not parody, but it's, I am trying to do something that's sort of the opposite of parody, like homage. Yeah, I mean, that help? It, 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 were they to come after you, they would basically look for all the elements of commonality between the original and then your kind of cover book. Yeah. Uh, and they would say, well, here on page seven, there's three sentences that are, were lifted verbatim. The, in, in the aggregate, the more of that stuff you've taken, the less of a right you have to do it. If you're just kind of rephrasing, and I, I've seen situations where somebody took some text and basically reworded the whole thing. You know, it was just changed it or made it the yeah. voice, but basically just said the same thing or said it differently, uh, but it's still in the order that it was put together, the general gist of what they're getting at, it's still technically illegal and you know. Is there any relationship besides parody that is defensible by law? Um, I, I love this book. My act of rewriting it is an act of homage at some level. Is How come I have to make fun or make parody to be defensible? I mean, you could say it's it's commentary, or you could say that it's it's almost an intellectual exercise. So, from a scholarship uh -huh. uh, standpoint, those are both things that are under the the rubric of, of fair use as well. Um, but you know, it also depends on how commercial you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you're not selling a, a lot of copies of this, it's not a big deal. Or if you're just giving these away, mm -hmm. that makes it a little more fair. You're still in that gray area of illegality, but, at the, but, but it's not, it's, it's less infringing than an overt, I've got them selling a zillion copies on, on Amazon with this whole thing. Similar dynamic then to some of what you described per yacht. Um, and I'm curious to ask yacht, and we're sort of getting to the point uh, it, uh, to draw our co conversation to a close so that we can take this um, received wisdom and as a group actually co-author with no traceable origin of who contributed what, new copyright law. So we're, we're in a position tonight to make a document uh, that nobody uh, can, can be sued for. Uh, so uh, uh, join us, uh, to stick around for that. The transition will be quite smooth. But I wonder, given this landscape you hear, do you as a band uh, and a project have an interest in m making specific illegal work to trigger these questions, or are you just trying to make work uh, and you hope you don't get in trouble? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, there's a, we have something of a rebellious spirit when it comes to these things, and we're also genuinely curious as to what will happen if we do something, you know, the cause and effect of it. Like, oh, let's do this, let's make this cover, and then we'll just see what happens. You know, what's the worst that could possibly happen? They're not gonna throw us in jail. We didn't make, you know, 10,000 copies. Could they be thrown in jail? No. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's usually two things that'll happen. Uh, the first is you'll get a, a nasty gram from some big law firm in LA or New York saying cease and desist. Well, we have an example of one right here. Oh, actually. sweet. <laughs> yeah. Jonah, this you, isn't for you, music, though. Will you show Exhibit A? Uh, earlier, last year, the, John and I are both uh, largely n influenced by non-musical things in our lives and as a band. And, and we love to pay homage to, to a lot of things and to, uh, to visual art and to uh, design and iconography. And so we designed this t-shirt. Excuse me. We designed this t-shirt that is loosely based upon the Oregon Lottery logo. It's Very loosely. Exactly, the Oregon Lottery logo. And we put it up on, uh, we didn't even make it actually. We put it up on Flickr as a potential design and said, oh, what do you guys, you know, what do you think? Should we make this t-shirt? And almost immediately afterwards, received this letter from the Oregon Department of Justice. Uh, from the Office of the a Attorney it has General. Come, it has come to our attention that you are using a design identical to the design contained in Oregon Lottery's trademark on a t-shirt that shows a distinctive cross-finger design with the words Yacht Oregon underneath it. It is our belief that you may also be using the cross-finger design in merchandise and promotional material. Your use of Oregon Lottery's trademark may create a likelihood of confusion as to the sponsorship of your activities and promotional materials, and create a misleading inference of Oregon Lottery's endorsement of the same. Further, such use may threaten Oregon Lottery's interest in preserving its rights in its registered trademark. So th the offense was that we might, what the uh, people might confuse us, our sponsorship with the Oregon well, Lottery? Consumer confusion. They, they basically would, the theory is that by using their symbol, people might think there's, you're sponsored by the Oregon Lottery. Uh, you know, so, uh, I, I, 
you know, that was a pretty mild letter. Usually it's like the hounds of hell will be in the black helicopters will be coming by to talk to you about this. Um, they, I noticed Dogs that they didn't, choppers. <laughs> they, they didn't say cease and desist or, or, or you know, I mean, that's, it, that's pretty mild because in theory, you're not selling lottery tickets and they aren't playing music. Well, we offered uh, that we would, be, uh, we would be open to sponsorship, but they didn't want to. The funny thing is, too, there's, a, there's an, another side to the story that's pretty funny. Um, maybe two years before we received this letter, I had actually... Um, licensed a song to the Oregon Lottery to use in, in TV commercials, a song that already existed, a yacht song. And so I kind of already was an employee of the... What song? Oregon Lottery. What? I, the song I Love a Computer. Really? Yeah, it was used in a... Yeah. Yeah, and when we, when we offered that... I think it was an ad for Scratch-its, Scratch-offs, whatever those are called. <laughs> scratch -ums. When we offered a potential collaboration between us, they, they told us that they, were, they didn't see a, a useful advantage for them. Yeah, and that was actually kind of written in character. Didn't you write those emails back and forth with this woman? Yeah. Anyway, we have a lot of these t-shirts. We can't sell them in Oregon, so we're going to give we them can. out we just tonight. Uh, yeah. These are, this is the rest of them. We've sold yeah. them on tour. Yeah. My idea was then to reinvent it as parody and saying that Yacht should actually create scratchets that that mock the the lottery and then if they came after it. But it was a lot of work. We didn't do that. Yeah, and actually that it that design kind of operates on two levels. There, there's some copyright aspects to it, but really what they're talking about from that standpoint of that letter is trademarks. Right. So trademark parodies are, the law is pretty well established on that, that you can't mess with other people's trademarks. You have a lot more leeway. There is no fair use for trademark uh, kind of parodies the way it exists for copyrights. You still see a lot of this stuff. I was like going to Saturday Market, just seeing the latest in, in you know, uh, Trademark parodies, bumper stickers, and Fed up, star fucks, yeah. It, mm -hmm. So I mean, stuff like that. It's it's very common, and usually you look at those stickers and uh, you know, you know, made in whatever. It's like you'll never track those people down. So mm -hmm. it kind of again flies under the radar. And you know. so you mentioned Shepard Ferry in that case. Uh, in closing, as a copyright lawyer, where are you looking right now uh, for either the actions in cultural production? Uh, or the people who've got a critical eye toward it and are uh, creating problems like these t-shirts, where are you looking now for uh, kind of the most productive uh, gestures? Is it going to be in pop music? Is it? Uh, do you see anything on the horizon that we can... Uh, I don't see a lot in music because of the sampling issue. It's so hardcore and people are so aggressive about it that unless you have these things like Danger Mouse, which... Do um, you want to talk about the Danger Mouse album a little bit? It's it's this guy, uh, he oh, I, I forget his name. He actually used to live in Athens, Georgia. I used to buy records from him at a small small record shop. But he, I mean, it's a really good good idea. He he it was a is a mashup between uh, Jay Z and the and the and the it's the Black Album and the White Album. So it made the Gray Album. White Album and by the Beatles. Yeah. White Album by the Beatles. Yeah. And it uh, he just released it for free, and it 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 uh, was picked up very quickly. First by uh, copy left geeks on the internet, honestly, which was weird that they sort of blew the record up because they're not necessarily known for being the most discerning music fans, but it's a pretty good record. You know. So, I mean, something like that where it's fly under the radar creativity and you have somebody like the Beatles estates uh, that are usually pretty, they'll go after anything that moves, but they let that one slide, I think probably from a creative standpoint. Um, and I don't know what the, the deal with, was with Jay-Z, but it was one of those things where it was so unique and so non-competitive that I think that might have been a real open door had they gone through it. Um, I think the Girl Talk stuff is so inspiring in a lot of ways. And then you hear a lot of other mashups. I mean, people do some really, really cool stuff that's very illegal, but there's such intrinsic kind of entertainment value, and you may have those situations where the labels don't want to be, be perceived as being uncool. I mean, like, like Metallica a few years ago. Uh, you know, when they, they, when they came out against like uh, you Napster, know, the, the yeah. Napster thing, they lost so much street credibility with that whole thing. I mean, so it's one of those, it's a fine line to, to, to kind of walk on that, but I think the Ferry case really um, has uh, some really amazing stuff on both sides of that as far as great arguments, and I'm really torn uh, on that because on one hand, I'm pretty much a copyright radical, but everybody I work with makes their money from creativity, and I have to respect that and have to kind of envision a world where, where creatives do get compensated fairly for their output. So it, it's really a fine line. 
Well, there's, uh, these are a set of issues that can open up uh, indefinitely, and I hope what we see is them opening up through um, uh, intelligently and um, gracefully conceived experiments, whether they're T-shirts, music, or uh, uh, cover novels, La Cucaracha by Chloe Jaron, available on lulu.com. Um, we're, we're about to... Um, <laughs> Um, uh, we're about to transition into a writing stage. I do see a couple of hands, so um, let's take one or two questions and then make our transition. Uh, do you have the, the wireless? Hi, this is the, hello? I'm not there yet. Oh, this is for uh, Peter. Can you talk about how the um, Fair Use Clause exempts music? I think there's an exemption somewhere, and kind of confuses me that statement. I, I'm a little unsure of what you're asking. As far as it, it basically applies to any type of creative content, so it's it's again music, visual art, text, anything that you can think of, photography. Um, so I, I'm I don't think there's anything really specific about music in there, as far as allowances or or uh, special kind of. Uh, rights that, that musicians would have? Well, for copying music, I guess it's, it's related to copying music. Okay. I think it's related to copying music, um, and I can't remember where it falls in there, but it's something about you can't, can't make copies. Uh, there, there is one thing, um, <laughs> I, the only thing I can kind of think of is if, if you buy a CD, you're able to sell that CD, or you're able to make, it, it, you know, kind of a, you buy a CD, the understanding is you can make a copy for your car or whatever, or, I mean, it's kind of the first sale doctrine is what that, what's that, what that's called. Now, does that, does that apply to MP3s? Could we start a used MP3 store? Yes, you could. Okay. No. <laughs> Wait, no? <laughs> he said yes. What? First answer is the right answer. Yes or no? Uh, probably not. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question about, uh, it seems that in practical terms, you're really including the audience of who's listening to the music. Like, if you have a small audience, you could get away with it, versus if you have a big audience, then you have this, like, recognition and you can get in trouble. And I was wondering if there's any way to possibly write that into the law, such that, like, a small artist who has a small audience is actually legally different from, like, a corporate label artist. But we're going to be rewriting the copyright laws later on. I, it, it's an Good interesting call. thing, but a lot of it comes down to the, the subjective aspect of it. It's like, uh, you know, what if you're a large uh, artist, but you have kind of a radical streak? Or if you're kind of, what, what, what constitutes large and small? Well, um, I mean, that would be pretty simple numbers of sales. You know, there could be a cutoff line of when you sell a million copies of your record, you are in a legally different category. What if you get, oh, whoa. <laughs> Be based Jesus. on volume. What if you get famous for making a copy, like a you know, an illegal song? You know, what if you're like Danger Mouse? You start small and then you get big. So I, I actually need your mic. It's louder. Uh, yeah, it is louder. Uh. That's why I need it. So I think that's exactly Peter's answer was exactly correct. You are about to have a chance to write that into law. Um, what you see up on first of all, thank you, Peter Shaver, Mike Merrill. John Bechtold, Claire Evans, and Marcus Estes, very much. Thank you. <laughs> They've given us some language which we can now put into law. What you see on the screen to your left is an application called Etherpad. Any one of us in this room can start to author in that space of the page. Uh, in fact, why don't you, uh, uh, Kirsten? Why don't you go ahead and underneath the initial phrases and before the V 1.0, uh, go ahead and type a, a message to us of uh, encouragement. Yeah. So Kirsten is right now on a computer which is going to the Etherpad page. Uh, however, uh, Zach, are you over there? Why don't you change what she's writing? And um, <laughs> if you are uh, in possession of a laptop right now, any number of us up to 60, is that the right arrangement, Marcus? 64, yeah. 64 of us can all be operating on this page at once without trace of authorship. In fact, uh, Marcus, why don't you take mine and it's uh, opened up to the page and you start dealing with what, uh, and Kirsten and Zach, go ahead and keep on dealing with it. What we have on the page to begin with is some existing copyright law language. 
um, a, a number of key elements of existing law, which either through your direct interventions, such as these three are now doing, and there's an open computer over by Kirsten and Zach, if you have a laptop with you, we can give you a password. If you do not have a laptop and don't want to come up, using your Twitter feed, as we've been doing throughout this uh, uh, meeting, go ahead and post what you want to have in there. Zach and Kirsten are going to type it in and put it in the Etherpad document. For the next 15 to 20 minutes, this group, using Twitter with the hash mark free culture, and using any open laptop, and again, if you've got one with you, we can hook you into the wireless system here. Peter Gunn, who's back at his laptop, and he's waving at you now, will sign you in. We are going to take that page, and without any trace of who's doing the work, whose thoughts and ideas it is, together as a group, co-author this new document. We have no way of knowing if the result will be legally useful or even sensible. This is a chance for us to make an experiment in co-authorship, which runs directly counter to all the traditions of authorship and originality that underlie copyright law. And the great thing is, it will result in new copyright law that I promise to print out and bind in book form to be sent to the Library of Congress. So this is real. Uh, now, I'm going to bring the mic up for a couple questions. But as I do, if you feel like you understand what's up and you need a beer in order to do your writing, go get one from Daniel Strong. In about uh, four minutes of time, uh, we will start deliberately uh, acting on the page. Uh, and right now, we'll answer some questions and try and clarify the method. Our goal is new copyright law. Do you have one of the wireless ones? Oh, yeah, there you go. Well, I noticed you guys never brought up the issue of BitTorrent. And um, as a web developer who's working on a global classified advertising site to basically be like Craigslist on steroids, I'm considering whether or not to allow users to post BitTorrent files to my website. Um, I guess I'll plug the website here, nolimitless.com. But um, the hosting company I'm going to be using, I'm sure you're probably aware of it, it's called PRQ. It's a Swedish company that hosts the Pirate Bay in WikiLeaks. And I was wondering, if it were an American hosting company, I would not consider putting BitTorrents. But because it's all being done overseas, I'm wondering whether or not to do that or not. Uh, so my suggestion is go ahead right now and write into our copyright law this exemption. <laughs> Uh, we'll get it in there, and then afterwards, Peter will answer your question for existing law. Uh, I'm sorry to inter in intervene there, but any questions about exactly how we're going to do this? Um, well, I guess you guys never addressed Creative Commons licensing and what role that could have in changing copyright, and I'm curious about that. Um, and I'm also curious about... Oh, I don't have my laptop with me. I'm also curious about artist protections. We all like to get free data and free information, and everybody is pretty much unilaterally in support of being able to get that stuff for free and other artists being able to create new art from it. But the issue still comes in that do we, I mean, do we go back to a system of patronage? Do we say, all right, we're now in a world where artists can never expect to be financially supported by their work as artists? As, is that debt as a career? How do we reconcile the two desires? And also, I want to talk about Creative Commons. Um, really important questions, and ones that I think Peter pointed toward at the end in describing his dilemma of how do you protect the ability of creative people to do their work. Um, given our ambitions tonight, uh, and it is a kind of unusual ambition, I think I'm going to ask that those important concerns float in the, in the way that you've stated them. Uh, and that we channel these interests into the act of co-writing just to see what happens. We'll be around at the end of co-writing and can recommence those discussions either together up front or back in this setting. I see Karen has a... Oh, just generally a suggestion that since I think there are a lot of folks who don't have a laptop or a, tweet or a Twitter account or maybe even their cell phone with them, it may be another way for people to contribute to the document is just to raise their hand and, and say make their comment the way that people have been doing, because I see that um, Zach and Kirsten have kind of absorbed those comments and they've made it into the document. That's a good idea. 
Yeah, there, there are several channels for you to get your content in, and one is to go over to the laptop that's open right next to Kirsten and use it. The other is I'll give you mine. Another is to go ahead and speak them out loud, but you could do it right by the, uh, the, the scribes table. So we are going to make that transition now. Now, those who have a device, go ahead and use it, but if you don't, there are five, six currently active laptops. Um, mine's in Marcus Estes's uh, lap, and he'd uh, gladly hand it over to you if you want to have it and go for it. Um, but yeah, this is a, an experiment, and what happens with a crowd who's able to co-author a document, we don't know. It's kind of a free fall, uh, but we've got nice elements in the room. Good, intelligent people, a little bit of beer, some food, and a subject. So come on and have at it. This is, it's kind of like the talk show atmosphere. Come on down. Uh, laptop Holler, over who there. wants a laptop? And uh, if using Put the microphone to speak out loud laptop. is helpful, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, I'd like to add um, a more clear definition of damages in the Copyright uh, Infringement Act. So instead of having a $150,000 um, statutory damage provision in the Copyright Act, uh, which is totally nonsensical to me, um, I'd like to see there be a, a clearer definition of damages um, and uh, something along the lines of um, percentage of profits for infringing works sold. Is that a, a, a type of damages that is currently enforced in, in case law? So where does the $150,000 statutory damage usually come in? Normal damages are basically whatever an infringer gained through the use of another person's property or the amount that the, the person lost. So if I'm a graphic designer, I normally charge uh, $1,000 for some imagery. Uh, that would be mo one measure of damages. But if somebody took that, made mouse pads, and sold uh, $50,000 with it, you'd go after that higher amount. Now, the, uh, the federal copyright law has a provision called statutory damages. Basically, it, it, it says that uh, uh, it, you can go after if there's a willful infringement. Somebody really, really rips you off very blatantly, you're able to request up to $150,000 per infringement. And I think the reason that that's in there is that there are cases where if it's it, actual damages, the loss or the gain are easy to compute. But when you have something like Napster, where there was just rampant downloading of, you don't even know how much, uh, how, how many things are, you know, you can't compute the actual damages. So you just look at that and just say, all right, for every song on this album that was rampantly downloaded all these years, we're going to just ask for this high end, very and again, it was very willfully done. So you're able to ask for that higher measure of damages uh, based on the, the federal statute. So and again, proving the willful infringement usually, uh, you know, when you can, it comes up a, a lot with kind of pirated things where it's very evident about what the underlying work is and how uh, you know, how it was used. But if you can't put a, 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 a finger on that actual damage figure, that's where the, the statutory damages usually kick in. Again, anybody who wants to continu continue the conversation as we author, absolutely welcome to, either in the form of questions to Peter, who's graciously remained to um, field them all, uh, or in the form of making a statement. I'm curious how, um, in your position, like how, you're, how you would suggest reconciling what, what you said before, the situation of uh, where I guess coming from the standpoint of like a progressive attitude about copyright law, one would kind of generally hope to sort of lessen or at least bring down the, the, the difficulty that a lot of artists have in using these elements. But I guess the, I am curious what y your thoughts are on the opposite end of that spectrum where corporations will take you know, take the works of struggling or d generally, you know, 
even subversive artists and utilize that as product for you know f for their corporate gain like i guess um one example that happened where this happened a couple of times with minor threat there's been the, those cases where nike and urban outfitters have used these you know these iconic images for of these bands and without asking for permission at all um well, I, I guess I'd just like to hear your thoughts about yeah, it. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where just kind of, kind of buying street credibility. And, and, and the, the example you talked about, we were talking about music, but the minor threat thing flashed in my mind because it was one of those things where they took this very iconic uh, album uh, or EP cover and used that uh, in a skateboarding uh, ad. I think it was, or I don't know if it was an ad or just some kind of like point of purchase things or whatever. Right. But, um, you know, and, and, and Minor Threat is a very, have probably of, of any music band out there, is just kind of has so much integrity about the usage of their imagery and everything for commercial purposes. Right. They even sell their CDs and all their material very inexpensively because they're very street level in that sense. But that kind of co-option of, of imagery, I mean, that's just normal kind of commercial behavior. Uh, and, and typically... I mean, it, it, on, on a lot of levels, both from the imagery and were they to use the music, for an example, you'd have to get permission to kind of do that. Right. Um, I, I, I work with a lot of bands who's, uh, you know, very pretty obscure local Portland bands whose material gets picked up for use in like uh, Europe-wide uh, advertising campaigns. I did some stuff with the uh, the Yellow Swans and their, their thing was used in this big um, uh, product release for Sony Europe. I mean, and noise what's that? They're noise That's the ah, okay. <laughs> They'd be into that. So, but one of these things where it's very, it's kind of so far out there that, um, but but again, they went through all the proper channels. Got all the we 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 crossed the T's and dotted the I's as far as the the ability to use some of that pretty obscure kind of out there material. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I, there was a question in what you said about uh, you know how to respond to that. But it is one of those things where, and, and the the point I didn't get to address was how far a band like Yacht can go to kind of push the limit, like Negative Land, or really like kind of how much you can kind of work the system or be somewhat subversive and do something that's kind of, uh, you know, far out to kind of, um, you know, and, and how much you can kind of get away with. It's a real fine line with that stuff. I guess what my question was, uh, I don't think I immediately, that I said it directly, but I, is how do you feel, how is it possible to protect artists rights to use things creatively and still protect the rights of artists from corporate interests in that in, in, with with in, with regard to copyright for, law for you to use something creatively another well, artist material I, in, in in terms of like developing a better system for copyright law how do, do you feel like there's a way that it's possible to have that line where it, it does also protect the, the artists where and allows for artistic... Yeah, um, somebody mentioned the um, uh, Creative Commons. and are, are many of you familiar with Creative Commons? It's basically a system that runs in parallel to the, uh, the federal copyright system. But what it allows for is if you create something, you can just say, put it out there. It's, it's kind of like open source stuff. You can just say, um, I'm allowing other people to take this and remix it and do stuff with it. You might put attach certain strings to it saying that if you use it, you have to credit me or you can't do anything commercial with it. So you can, I think it, that it answers your question about there is that system and it's totally voluntary and the problem with Creative Com Commons is that there's no kind of enforcement mechanism. So if somebody takes your stuff and uses it and even if they give you uh, kind of adhere to the strings you attach to it, if they go beyond that, you still have to come back to the regular copyright law to enforce that against somebody. So it, it, it's kind of tough, but I think a lot of creatives bought into that um, because it's it's a cool system to just put stuff out there. Um, a couple of years ago, Wired Magazine put out a, um, an issue with a whole CD of material that was kind of like artists like um, uh, David Byrne, 
put a bunch of tracks and just said, hey, do with this what you will. I, you know, I'm not attached to it. I want this to be remixed, remastered. Just take it and, and run with it. Do something creative with it and maybe send me a copy so I can kind of see what you did. Um, other artists like uh, I, I think Todd Rundgren put a bunch of stuff on his uh, on a website just saying these are just the tracks for something. Go ahead and remix it. Do whatever you want with it, but you know, it'd be cool to send me a copy of it. And don't you can't put it out yourself, but you can take it and and do something creative with his pre-existing content. So, I want to point out we have some things coming into law now. It is illegal to sue an artist who made less money than you for a copy of your work. I think that makes good sense. Um, scrolling down, is our, uh, Peter, is our machine capable of scrolling down? Because there's quite a bit of content below there. Uh, one, Creative Commons exists. And those of you who don't know, Creative Commons is a set of uh, laws concerning copyright written by lawyers intended to give more flexible relationships and uh, options to people who are making original work. For example, you can designate that people can borrow the work so long as they do not prevent borrowing of what they make with it. Uh, and Creative Commons offers a range of less strict and less um, uh, a, a more flexible things that you can put into law. Creative Commons exists. Where did it go now? So we can allow people to be specific about what kinds of uses they allow and don't. Let's adopt this system into law. Peter, could you comment? Is Creative Commons, in fact, a viable piece of, of, of legal uh, you know, a legal toolkit? Yeah, it, it's very viable. And in fact, it was developed by a, uh, a professor at, uh, or it, it partly developed by a professor at Stanford who's been very active in the kind of free culture kind of thing, or especially in the, in, in the digital uh, era, area. Um, I think if it had a, an enforcement mechanism, for me, it would be more viable. But it, it's a great system, and people are buying into it. They are kind of putting stuff out there. And I think, um, as the question uh, was from Zach, uh, you know, about the, the stuff about you know, putting stuff out there that you, that you can remix and reuse. So mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people have adopted it, but it, it's, it hasn't gone that far yet. It'd be interesting to see how more we could develop that concept. Other questions, other comments uh, here, sir. What does the role of precedence, uh, I mean, does that, here's the example. I have a record label and I put out an artist who um, has a song that pretty heavily samples the Microsoft Windows system sounds, like startup sounds, and um, that's been done before by a couple bands, but maybe not quite as recognizably. And we've been pretty under the radar, but recently had an opportunity to have the song on like a network r reality show. Um, and so it's not as under the radar. I mean, if there is any trouble, is there any power in the precedence of it happening before or? Uh, you know, with a, an example like that, I mean, in theory, you might have a fair use argument just to say that, you know, it, it's not competing with that. It's just, it's kind of like using like Atari game stuff. Oh. I mean, a lot of people have done things with that over the years. Right. Um, or, or, or certain like Casio, like pre-programmed things. I mean, there's a lot of ass things out there that, that there's a little license to do it, but you get to that level and Microsoft, I, I used to work for, for their law firm, uh, and they are, they're pretty tough about that stuff, but it also is one of those things where from a, a credibility or from a uh, uh, kind of user-friendly thing, they, they may not go after you, but you may get a letter like the one uh, Claire read where yeah. it's just stop doing it or one of those things. Um, but, you know, for something like that, I, I think it really depends. And as I said, because it's so discretionary as to if Microsoft thinks it's cool, then you're not going to have any hassles. But it, that's it's their decision. And in theory, it is, uh, you know, you'd have to get sample uh, uh, sample licenses to use that stuff. Is it possible that those sounds are trademarked? Because they're so part of the brand or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it, copyright. It, it, like the, I'm trying to think. Is it NBC or CBS has that dum dum dum? That's NBC. a trademark. So, so that does operate. You can do that. I don't know if uh, Microsoft's gone that far, but it wouldn't surprise me because I mean, there's certain things. If you heard it, it's kind of like seeing the swoosh. There's no nothing that says Nike, but your brain goes 
Nike. Yeah. And you know, but but if you if you heard some of those tones, you might go, oh, it's Microsoft. That's well, pretty cool. And in Wally, the uh, Macintosh startup sound was so. Uh, all of the meanings in that movie uh, around that sound were because it was so clearly a Mac starting up. But I, but I bet they cleared that and got permission to use <laughs> it. So, yeah. We're, um, yeah. Hey, Steve, if you'd hand the mic back to... Um, no, I don't need it But yeah, you do, because we're recording it, and then we can hear you in the recording. I, I wanted to say that... This um, will be used against you. We are, um, five or, we are five or ten, I'd say five minutes kind of away from where we'll close up. So I encourage all of you who are writing, and particularly the scribes up front, to go ahead and transform speculations and questions into definitive statements, scribes. Transform, uh, on, on your pad there, transform questions or speculations into something definitive, something that a lawyer can use in court. When we close down the page, about five minutes from now, uh, I'm gonna ask the scribes, and then anyone in the audience who wants to, to go ahead and read out loud a particular line of the new law that they like a lot. And that'll be our close together. Uh, as I say, I will then make a paper document out of this, bind it, and send it to the Library of Congress. Um, but before we get to that close of the document, again, focus on turning that language into something a lawyer can use, definitive and clear. And you had a, a comment. So is the law and order sound copyrighted? Oh, the it's well, I mean, it's copyrighted probably in that they paid a composer to come up with it, and as part of the show, um, it would be a, a certainly a copyrightable element. Although I have to tell you, I've seen a lot of parodies that have used that, so it's you know. Uh, do you want a microphone there? You should have. Lovely. <laughs> That'll be recorded too, probably. Um, somebody raised, raised BitTorrent earlier, and we talked a little bit about um, punitive damages. And I wonder if, um, if you could comment on, uh, fairly recently there was, I think, a decision <coughs> in the case against that woman who downloaded, I think, 28 songs or shared them on a, a BitTorrent site. Um, and I think that the damages were like two million, or they were, they were in the millions of dollars against a, like a single person, just a regular person. Um, which seems extreme, obviously, and obviously is not something she's able, ever going to be able to pay. Um, that'll probably come down, I guess, on appeal, but can you just comment on what's going on there with those massive executionary damages? Yeah, and I, I think what you're talking about is some of the RIA cases where the Recording Institute of America going after people who illegally were caught with illegally downloaded stuff or were enabling, uh, you know, uploading things. And I think in some of these cases where you have, a, a, as I'm not sure about that one, but you have a parent who's kind of like, well, I don't know what my 13-year-old was doing using my computer, my access codes, whatever. But as I said, pointed out earlier, that because it's a strict liability offense, it doesn't matter what your intention was or whatever, um, you know, you can get caught for that. And obviously the, the, the high damage figure in that was based on a statutory damage level because it, it, it's so unclear about how many downloads were enabled or whatever, but, um, and, and it was actually doubled because what you had was a, an award to the owner of the sound recording and an owner of the uh, song composition. So it, it, you know, both of those parties were involved with that and that's how that got so so high. But It just seems so um, amazing to think that the, the corporations could actually argue that they lost that amount, for instance, of income. It, it seems wildly out of skew with the scale of, I mean, in this particular case, it was a handful of songs. Well, the, the record companies are hurting pretty badly, and the and the, the group that brings that is kind of a trade organization that's that's owned and operated by most of what's left of the big labels. So it's kind of just like that last bulwark they're trying to put up there to kind of uh, you know stem the flow of theft. And and it's really encouraging now with the success of um, you know iTunes, where the, you had this whole generation, the whole Napster generation, growing up thinking that music is free. Now you have people are going, hey, 99 cents, bug 99, I can afford that. They are buying music, and, and uh, iTunes is now the largest retailer of music in the country. So it, it's kind of um, incredible that there's been that sea change in, in, in consumer perception that way. But they're still trying really hard to just kind of 
uh, bulk up the bottom line and do whatever they can to maintain profitability. A, a lot of those record labels are, are publicly held, so you have uh, angry shareholders saying, you know, you need to maximize uh, the, the flow here. This is one of the areas that is so hard to remember in the narrow part of history that we live in, but the way that artists have made money off what they make has only for a very short time been by securing the legal right to prevent others from doing something. There's a long, long history of creative work which did not have that as its root protection. Uh, and we're seeing that the market itself is changing now to recognize how much uh, the ownership of originality is, is hard to defend and hard to define. Uh, there's a book uh, called Noise uh, by Jacques Attali, A-T-A-L-I. I believe that's how you spell his last name. And uh, it is a history of popular music going back to the troubadours. Uh, so to the fift uh, 14th and 15th centuries, and looking at the ways that the production of popular song uh, was contextualized legally and culturally. And it helps to give a little bit of, a bit of perspective to this very narrow slice of time in which the pre to prevent others from using your content has become uh, the, the only defense for a lot of artists. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll point out about this creative re reimagination of the copyright laws is that the copyright laws have actually changed a number of times uh, since they were, were started, big major revisions, and um, it, it's, it used to be a very limited right. You only had 26 years of protection. Now it's the author's life plus 70 years. Right. So it really has become this thing that's almost unlimited in a lot of senses. And you know, the, the, the whole theory about the public domain, where once the, those limited rights ended, they went into this big pool for everybody to use and interpret and do what they will with. And it was kind of like you had the, the payment for that kind of uh, sweat of the brow, as they like to call it, um, is that limited monopoly. And then it was, it, went, it was for everybody to use. And we've really lost a lot of that. And that would be my big revision of it, mm -hmm. is tailoring that stuff back and making it more of a limited right. We're about to regain those limits. Uh, I believe that the new law suggests 14 years as the duration of a, uh, of a copyright. So let's go ahead and draw it in. I see that the scribes have been doing a good job of trying to rationalize our production uh, into th four sections, boundaries, damages, litigation, and what's the fourth there? Default. And defaults. Um, let's close our time together by taking a look at the document. Um, it's hard for you to all see it uh, on the screen because it's so long now. I'll scroll through it while our two scribes uh, take up the microphone and recite to us. Oh, in fact, Peter Gunn will be scrolling through it so you can kind of browse. Zach Rose on the right and Kirsten Polson House on the left have been doing a lot of the typing and I asked them if they would pick out mm -hmm. particular passages in the new law that they felt especially excited about and tell us them out loud. And as you hear them and as you see the scrolling up in front of you, Go ahead, and if you've got one that you think needs to be said out loud too, raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. Um, Zach and Kirsten, what, to, what have you found in the new law that's ex especially exciting to you? So here we go. Um, is this on? No. Well, here's one. I can give you mine. This one's definitely louder. Uh, clips, tips, samples, and sound clips from any motion picture, soundtrack, neon sign, record label of any kind are all kinds are allowed to be used as long as they're considered covered, remixed, and used in general as long as it is all in good fun. The judgment of what is covered is, the judgment of what is covered or remixed is in the hands of the prosecutor, defendant, and each individual jury member. We know it when we see it. Uh, as you find a passage, uh, be sure that you tell Peter what part of the documents it, it is in, and he'll scroll to it. Uh, the next one's kind of directly below that. A cutoff at a certain number of sales should exist such that after an artist has sold 100 billion copies or units, they can no longer make copyright infringement claims. <laughs> a million. No, it's changed. This is the law. <laughs> it, I think it does say a million. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep adding zeros. <laughs> A uh, percentage of legal fees around the issue of copyright should be collected and issued as a franchise fee, similar to precedent of corporate cable boundaries funding of <laughs> public access institutions. 
issued to a common legal defense fund to support artists being prosecuted for violations of copyright law. <laughs> Did we already say the one with the, the burden of proof should be on the plaintiff? Someone accuses you of infringement or you claim fair use, it should be the burden to prove that it's not. And um, that would ship the fiscal balance. Poor individuals sued for infringement can really afford to defend no matter how legitimate their use. And the result is that people are extremely gun shy and it stifles creativity and scholarship. Very good point. Peter, would you tell us, um, now that we have a new set of laws, um, how is your job? Is it going to be easier? Uh, it, it'll be easier, yeah. Because <laughs> I'll be fighting the man with everybody else, so. Uh, is there anything in the new law which you actually uh, would find useful in the context of a court case? Uh, or am I asking you a difficult professional question that you have to answer next week when we um, come to you, uh, when we phone you from jail? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of this stuff, it, it, you have to keep in mind that you're dealing with somebody with a very rigid legalistic mind. I mean, to, to kind of make this, as it was, we uh, advertise as a more psychedelic thing, you have to kind of put a lot of that stuff aside and really look at it. It's kind of like um, I, I do a lot of mediation, and what I usually tell people at the beginning of mediation is forget what the law is throw the law books out the window. It doesn't matter who's wrong or right. Wrong or right. What, what kind of um, middle ground can we find that everybody can work with? So mm -hmm. you wouldn't have the same kind of litigation issues. You'd have this kind of more uh, cooperative uh, model for, for using and creating stuff. So it would, I, I want to get completely out of that mindset. But I love the, uh, what was the one about the, uh, the franchise fee? I think that's a terrific uh, concept. So um, uh, Mike Merrill, uh, who uh, first introduced me and uh, several others to co-authoring on a page like this through a software called Coda, uh, which is also available. Uh, Mike, can you uh, advise the scribes on how to shut the page down so that the law is frozen? Um, or is that hard to do? Uh, Marcus, maybe you could do it. So this document that's about to be uh, exported is going to be posted on teamyacht.com backslash free culture. And as I say, I'll be taking it to my printing machine uh, to put it on paper and, and bind it. Um, I want to thank you all for taking the free fall with us and just seeing what it's like to go from organized and normative conversation uh, to an entirely other relationship of co-authoring in a space that's not either regulated or even trackable. Um, it's my hope that part of what UO is going to offer in its public space here will be not only the uh, delights of uh, good mind speaking and of us gathering in ways that we're used to, but also exactly this kind of thing, a chance to experiment together. And I want to thank you all for doing that tonight. And thank you, Peter. Karen Monroe. Well, I, Matthew has really said it all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our sponsors who helped make this possible tonight. Uh, remember, there are two more events happening Thursday nights this month. If you come back down, you can talk about bicyclists' rights or what was the other one? <laughs> Visual, Visual arts. Visual arts. Kristen knows about that one. Yes. Um, thanks. Thanks to everybody. Thanks also to Zach, who is not only a scribe but who also designed our poster, which you could admire on your way out the door on the easel. Um, have a lovely evening, and if you're carrying on to PDX Pop, have a great time there, too. Yeah, I just wanted to plug Yacht's fabulous new album, too, that was uh, wonderfully reviewed in the uh, this week's Willamette Week. Uh, they are also on stage now at City Hall, so if anybody uh, would care to go over there, um, it should be a pretty cool show tonight. <laughs>